All right, so you've got your phone and you've got your controller. You're ready to play your favorite retro games. You might start searching for emulators in the Play Store and you will see an infinite amount of options, some for a fee and some for free, but the latter always with the typical problem of not knowing when another ad is going to pop up. Among so many, which one is the best? Today, we will see RetroArch, a free option without ads and with support for almost all classic consoles, with additional functions that helps you organize your game library. It has a small initial configuration process, which we will see, but once it's ready, it's wonderful. Welcome back, this is Zero to Tech. Before we start, a little introduction to emulation. An emulator is nothing more than an application or software that simulates the operation of a console. And just like in a real console, the games don't come with the emulator. They come in separate files, usually called ROMs. They take their name from the chips used in cartridges. What is important is to understand that, although you can download the emulator, you must add your own ROMs. Now, RetroArch as such is not an emulator. It is rather a frontend for emulators. It is basically a graphical interface that allows you to sort, browse, and play your retro games in an easy way that also looks great. To emulate, RetroArch uses elements called cores, which you can download directly from the application. There are cores for almost every console you can think. Also, RetroArch is cross-platform, so much of this video is also applicable to Windows, Linux, Mac, or iOS. Once you got it set up, and you have added your games, RetroArch gives you a very quick access to your library. You just open it, select a game, and start playing. Installing it is very easy. We just go to the Play Store and look for RetroArch. Be careful because there are two versions, and we don't want the first one that comes out. We should look for the one that says RetroArch Plus. The other one is for older Android versions. The interface is very simple, like any other phone app. This is called GLUI. It is one of the four different interfaces that you can use. It's the default one for phones since it was designed with the touchscreen in mind. If you only play using the touchscreen, Monster, this is the one to use. To change the interface, we click on the configuration menu. On the next screen, we look for user interface. And within, we look for menu. By clicking on it, RetroArch shows its four options. First, GLUI, the one you are using right now. The next one is called Awesome, based on the switch interface. If you use portrait mode, you'll see it's not designed for phone use. The right thing to do is to use it in landscape. This interface is supposed to be used with a controller. You can even see small icons depicting what each button does. You simply use the arrows to move between the side menus and its options on the right side. To select an option, we use the A button. To return, we use the B button. If for some reason you are using this interface with the touch screen, you will need to touch the options two times. One to select it and the second one to activate it. If you need to go back, you must click on the title of the screen, on the top left side. The third interface is called RGUI. This menu is the simplest of all. It is intended to have a retro look, with a pixelated font and a linear structure. Not only does it look simpler, it is also focused on devices with few resources. To navigate it with a controller, you simply select the menu item with the button A to open it. We can still return by pressing B. If you try to use this interface with the touch, as with the previous one, you will have to select things two times. If you want to return, you touch the title in the screen, in this case, up in the center. The last one is called XMB. This is the newest one, and will be quite familiar to anyone who has owned a PlayStation. Personally, I think it's the nicest and the easiest to understand, but you need to use it with a controller. Trying to use the touch is very tedious and doesn't make much sense. With a controller, it's very simple. Left and right to move between the upper menus, up and down to select an option. With a touchscreen, you must make horizontal or vertical movement for each menu item. Making longer movements is useless, and clicking directly on the icon doesn't help much either. You must navigate first to the item, to be able to select them. To return from a submenu, simply click on the submenu icon. I didn't say it before, but 
To apply the new interface, select the new one, then close RetroArch and open it again. Although XMB is the most complicated interface to use with the touch, it is the one we will use in the tutorial, because we are not monsters and it is the easiest one to use with the controller. However, all the settings are the same on all the interfaces. The next step is to download the cores. They are the real emulators, so you need them to play your ROMs. You must download at least one for each console you want to play. Downloading them is simple. We click on Load Core. It is empty because we haven't downloaded any yet. So we go to Download a Core. This shows you the list of cores available. You can see that each one indicates which console it is for. Let's start by downloading one for the original Nintendo or NES. The recommended one is called Mesen. To download it, we simply select it and it begins to download. When finished, we go back to the previous page and we can see the core is now available. Take the opportunity to download cores for the consoles you want. Some recommended ones are MGBA for the Game Boy Advance, SNEX 9X for the Super Nintendo, Genesis Plus GX for the Sega Genesis or the Mega Drive, and Mupin 64 Plus for the N64. Don't worry, I'll cover more consoles on future videos. Just remember that there are cores for many consoles. If you're interested in a specific one, leave a comment so we can check it on a future video. We now have our cores ready. The next step is to add the games. For this, you must put the ROM files in a folder. You can do this by downloading them directly on the phone or copying them from a computer. It's recommended to put all your games in one folder and it inside the RetroArch directory. Create a folder called ROMs and then add a new folder per console. Finally, copy the ROMs in each folder. You are not required to do so, it is simply considered a good practice among RetroArch users. RetroArch can read games inside zip files for most consoles. This helps you save space, just to make sure you have only one game per zip. Now, you'll need to add the ROMs to RetroArch. To do so, go to Load Content, then select Playlists, Import Content, Scan Directory. Here, look for the directory you put your ROMs in. Since they are inside the RetroArch directory, we select the first option, then ROMs, and then select the one console you want to add. I recommend doing it one by one for better results. We will start with the GBA. Select Scan Directory. Once you have scanned this directory, you'll find a new icon in the main menu with the Game Boy Advance icon. Select it to show the games it found. RetroArch will show the box art for each game. Continue to add the rest of the folders doing the same. Load, Content, Playlist, Import Content, Scan Directory, and navigate to the ROMs folder. Here, we now select Genesis, N64, NES, and finally SNES. As you see, the process is quite easy and fast. When we go back to the main menu, there is a new section for each of the new consoles. At times, the box art might not appear. This depends on the version of the ROM, where you downloaded them from, and the availability of said images in RetroArch. But if one does not appear, you can update the database to see if a new one is available. Just go to the Start menu, Online Updater, Playlist Thumbnails Updater, and select the console you want to update. To add more games later, you just repeat the same steps and RetroArch should find them and add the new ones to your library. As an additional tip, if RetroArch is having trouble detecting a game, you can try a manual search. It forces RetroArch to recognize the ROMs for a specific console. Just go to Load Content, Playlist, Import Content, and then select Manual Search. Then select the directory, then the console, and finally Start Search. This should help RetroArch detect all the ROMs. Finally, if this doesn't work, you can force the ROM to load and there will be no problem. Simply go to Load Content, navigate to Archive, and then select Load Archive. The game should load immediately. Very well. The next step is to configure your controller. RetroArch will detect and configure most controllers automatically, but if you want to change the mapping, you can do it in the settings. In this case, we are using the SN30 Pro Plus. 
connected via Bluetooth. For some reason, the front buttons are swapped, so we'll do a full setup. For this, go to Settings, select Input, then select Port 1 controls, and select Set all controls. At this point, Retroarch asks to press each button. Press each one for 4 seconds, and then it asks for the next one. If your controller don't have a specific button, don't worry, just skip them when prompt. The next thing is to set up a hotkey. This is a combination that allows us to pause the game and show the Retroarch quick menu, with additional options and functionality we will see later. To do so, simply go back to the input menu, select hotkeys, and then select menu toggle controller combo. I like to use L3 and R3, but you can select one that suits your controller the best. Also, if you're using a controller, you probably don't want to see the virtual controls on the screen. To remove them, simply go to Settings, On-Screen Display, On-Screen Overlay, and turn on Hide Overlay when controller is connected. You will no longer see the virtual controls while you play. Well, this was fine, but truthfully, it is a little complicated. But we are now ready to play. To start the game, there is not much else to do. Just go to the console we want and select the game to play. In this case, we are picking Altered Beast on the Sega Genesis. Select Run. The first time you run each game, it will ask you which code you want to use. Here we only have one, so select it. And then select Run again to start playing. Now you're going to remember how difficult classic games are especially the ones on the 8-bit era, but emulation provides a way to help you finish games you thought were impossible. These are save states. It is the ability to save your game at any time and be able to load that moment, as many times as you want, independent of whether the game had a save future or not. It is very easy. During the game, at any time, you can press the hub key, in our case R3 and L3, and select save state. This saves the exact moment you are in the game. Then, if you lose, or you didn't make the impossible jump, simply press the hotkey again and select Load State. The game will load right where you saved, and you can try again. Now, you can pass the famous Algear screen from the Ninja Turtles. I hope Retroarch helps you grow your nostalgia for retro games. You can finally finish those games that you thought were impossible, get all the secrets, or try that game you once saw, but never could play. Remember, Retroarch has many more settings and options. Come on, in such an evolved and successful project. You can start exploring them on your own, but if you're interested in a video where we review some of the more advanced options or emulator-specific settings, go and subscribe because they are coming. Remember that Retroarch is an open source project with no financial support. If you like it and want to support the project, either with time or money, I'll leave you the link to its donation page. It's important to keep projects like this alive. If you played all the way here, give the video a like and subscribe. And remember, retro games, modern technology, zero to tech.